So application timeline, April through September, design project and prepare application. August through September is going to be the campus timeline deadline. Again, we can talk a little more specifically about your campus deadline. Early October is the national application deadline. November through December, that's when we have our national screening committees. January through May is the host country review. And March through, the, March through June is the final selection and notification of the uh, awards. So these are other ways to stay connected with us. Uh, we have a huge social media following, but I wanted to take this time to really go through our website just because there's a lot of valuable information that will assist you with completing your application. So let's see. And I may need a little assistance because it is not projecting. Okay. I don't know, I know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's here, but it will not oh, project. Oh, it does. Yep. So it's not projecting. Laura, do you know anything? Yes, about um, we wrote it down. It was the something. Do you remember? Oh, okay. wrote it down. Okay, just bear with us for one moment. There we go. Windows P. Windows P. And we're going to click Extends here. Okay. Wherever our cursor is. Okay, while we're waiting to pull up the website, are there any questions about the application process, timelines, whether it be campus timelines or general timelines? Yes. Can you talk about the difference between the national and the campus deadline? Sure. Well, as you can see, our national deadline, uh, perhaps you can speak more to the campus deadline. The campus deadline is generally toward the end of August. Okay. Um, we set a fairly early deadline at MTSU because we want to give the student a chance to revise their application and essays after they interview with faculty and staff. So the process for us is we ideally want to before you apply for your full ride, you have your campus interview, and then following your full ride interview, once you get feedback um, from the PSU faculty and staff, you can revise it so that your application can be as strong as possible. Okay. Any other questions about deadlines before we start on the website? Yes. Apologize. Mm -hmm. We don't go here. Um, are there? Uh, campus deadlines for each university? Or how does that work? It depends on if you have a representative at your campus. Um, may I ask where you are attending? Um, okay. I'm not quite sure if you do have a representative, but you can find that information out on our website and I'll take you through that shortly. So here's the website for our student program. So the first place we're going to start would be types of awards. And again, the 2020-21 competition is closed, as you can see. But this will just be a point of reference. So we'll start with our Open Study and Research Awards. OK. So you first have the option to sort by discipline. So as you can see, we have arts, business, journalism, communication, and STEM. I'm going to start with arts. So as you can see, this gives me options for France, Hungary, Ireland, Portugal, Taiwan, and the United Kingdom. And this is just giving you the specific requirements for the award. Do I have any students here that are interested in perhaps um, exploring graduate opportunities? Okay. If you are interested, again, on the same page, you would click under the section for Fulbright graduate degree grants. And this is a list of all of the countries where you have the opportunity to uh, conduct graduate enrollment. So as you can see, Argentina, Australia, Belgium. Let's click on Australia. So you would see the options for Australia. So let's click here. 
And this gives you a description of the award. As you can see, for this particular award, uh, six postgrad scholarships to U.S. grad students or PhD, PhD students are offered. As you can see, the grant period is 10 months, well, eight to 10 months. And this gives you a little bit more information regarding the award, uh, language proficiency, and affiliation. It also goes over the ineligibility. So this isn't applicable to anyone in this room, and it's more regarding citizenship in Australia. So I am going back to my cursor. Again, it gives you additional scholarship opportunities. Some vary in length. I'm going to go back to eligibility. So this gives you more detail about the eligibility requirements. Do I happen to have any dual citizens in the room? Okay, so for the purpose of the recording, you are still eligible to apply if you are a dual citizen. However, the country that you also share dual citizenship with, there may be a possibility that you may not be eligible to conduct study in that country. So again, it's all going to depend on the specific award that you are applying to. And this just gives you an idea of some of the factors that impact your eligibility. So we're going to scroll back up. So we've discussed competition deadline. Uh, again, your campus deadline may be slightly, well, will be slightly different than our actual deadline. I'm going to scroll down to award benefits. And again, this is just a general overview of some of our benefits, uh, what your book or research allowance, uh, stipend, it's all going to depend on the specific award that you are applying to. Another question that I get often is about housing. Uh, let's just say you're going to France, for example. What are your ho housing options? It all depends on the award. Uh, students may stay in institution housing. There may be an opportunity to stay with a host family. Also, the poster committee may provide housing for students. Um, in more cases than not, you will be sharing housing with other students, uh, similar to a dorm style as you're used to here if you stay on campus. And I'm going to go back to types of awards. So we've walked through the study and research awards. Let's go through the teaching English and assistant awards. So again, it's categorized by region. For the purpose of the walkthrough, let's start with East Asia Pacific. So it gives you a list of all of the countries with available awards and it gives you the number of grants available. It gives you information regarding the placement type, placement locations, and the two, the last two categories are very important, uh, teaching commitment per week and host country language requirements. So I do encourage you if you are interested in this program to pay close attention to the teaching commitments per week. As you can see, some range between 25 hours, 22 hours, and as as many as 40 hours and in parentheses it in most cases will include if it includes teacher prep and for host country language requirements this is important because you will need to uh, for your language proficiency you will have to have a report done in these cases there is not a language proficient oh, there aren't any language requirements my apologies so again let's just scroll to another region we'll go to Europe and as you can see, the placement types range. You may see uh, primarily university, high school, all levels, so that's important to take into consideration. And when we get into this section, you will see the language requirements start to vary, opposed to East, uh, East Asia. As you can see, it ranges from novice to intermediate, so it's very important to pay attention to those. Now, for those who are interested in applying, are there any questions regarding language proficiency, any questions about teaching assignments, anything related to the teaching component of the program? No? Okay, so we are going to next go to factors in selection. 
This is very important. Applicants want to know how decisions are going to be rendered for their applications. So I just want to go through a couple of them. I know we spoke about personal qualifications. Again, what are you hoping to bring back to your home institution that you're learning or experiences from your host institution and vice versa? Quality and feasibility of the proposed as described in the statement of grant purpose. So the statement of grant purpose is going to be an outline for what you're proposing to do. And it needs to be very detailed and give insight into the proposed research project. Language preparation. Again, language preparation is going to be dependent upon the language requirements for the specific award. Let's see, extent to which the candidate and project will help to advance the Fulbright aim of promoting mutual understanding. Uh, what we'd like to say at Fulbright is we're looking for applicants that are cultural ambassadors. We are looking for projects that um, applicants plan to engage with their host communities and uh, with their universities if they're students at universities. And finally, requirements of the program in individual countries. Uh, in some countries, advanced degree candidates are preferred. It's all about just making sure you're reading the degree requirements. Um, as you can see in the previous slides, it's open to anyone with a bachelor's degree but not a doctorate degree. But each country does have preferences. So make sure you are looking at the preferences and that you're meeting all of the requirements. And I wanted to point out a couple other features on our website. So under the alumni section, you have a link to the State Department for our Fulbright alumni. So this is a great way to connect with other Fulbrighters. So in many cases, our potential applicants reach out uh, just for feedback about their personal experiences in the different countries. If they have questions about applica application materials, there have been instances where applicants have reached out to Fulbrighters just to review their materials and just give them a sense of if they're on the right track. This is a great way to connect with other Fulbrighters. And should you become a Fulbrighter, this is where you will be featured. This page also gives alumni highlights of different Fulbrighters that are active in the communities. So I will go back to the previous page. As I mentioned, once you become a Fulbrighter, you will become a part of the Fulbright Association. And this just gives you a little bit more information. It gives out different information about other Fulbright programs. I am actually on the scholar side. So this program is open to faculty, um, administrators, and other professionals. Uh, if you do decide to move on and complete your PhD, once you complete your PhD, you would come over to my side of the program and we offer similar opportunities for, well not studying, but research and teaching opportunities. And I will hit the back button and toggle back. This is the section, once you become a Fulbrighter, if you have any emergency questions or have questions about loan deferments, which is an option, or tax questions, you would come here. There's actually a self-service portal that will assist you with answering many of those questions. And this is more information about um, your Fulbright advisor. I know there was one young lady who asked if her campus had one. This is a way where you can search for an actual provider. So you can search by state if this is not your home institution. And that pretty much concludes the website tutorial. I do want to go back for one second and touch on the application checklist. So if you are proposing study and research, this gives you an idea of the academic checklist. And so what I do advise you to do is to print out a copy and do a checklist after you are completing each task. So the first task would be if your campus does have an advisor to meet with your advisor. And then again, it walks you through the next steps before submitting your application and what to do after. If I toggle back, 
It takes me to the application checklist for the ETA program. Again, if you do have a campus advisor, the first step would be to meet with your advisor and then go through the different prompts on the checklist to assist you with completing a successful application. And that, in a nutshell, is our website. As I said, the Fulbright program is heavily involved in social media. So we have a Twitter, we have an Instagram. And the great thing about our Instagram is that we feature students who are active on the program. So you're able to get a glimpse into what they're doing, their projects, their experiences abroad. Here you'll find additional information about the competition, Fulbright events. Again, if this is not your home institution, I do encourage you to take a look at Fulbright events. Your campus may be featured. And finally, news and notifications. You can sign up for any notifications that pertain to specific information that are discipline or area specific. And that concludes the walkthrough for our website. Are there any questions about the application process? Options? Yes. <laughs> um, is there anywhere where we can look at like the completed study and research from past Fulbright scholars mm -hmm. so that we can get inspiration for a direction to go? Sure. Unfortunately, we don't have prior applications available. However, your advisor. So. At MTSU, we try to make it a very, very supported process, so you are not alone in this application. I never give samples out, but I can let you read through some past applications that have been successful, and I can also help with answering just basic questions, so yes. Okay. So again, aside from having that support, you can also reach out to former Fulbrighters. As I said, our alumni, they are very active. They love to help applicants in terms of reviewing their materials or just answering questions about what was your project uh, can you give me a glimpse into what your experience was like so these are very great um, points of reference and support mechanisms anyone else have any other questions is anyone considering applying for this upcoming year okay and may I ask what your what the specifics are Oh, for this upcoming year, I'm just thinking about, I mean, I'm, um, I'm a grad student, mm -hmm. so maybe a study research. Okay. Here. Okay. And you? I'm a graduate study. Okay. Okay. Uh, one common question I get um, when I meet individually with students is, um, I know for the undergraduate uh, Fulbright, mm -hmm. for the student Fulbright, they want a host country engagement project mm -hmm. of some sort. So could you speak um, to what types of things that you've heard about mm -hmm. um, that students do? Because when students walk into my office, that's something that is usually a concern. Sure. Um, I can remember students who are um, engaged maybe in the arts discipline, teaching dance classes within the community or some sort of artist project. Um, just something that's very hands-on and that engages the community within your host country. So it all depends. But those are just some of the examples that I've encountered before. Uh, there was a student who studied dance for many years. That was her project. That was something that she was very passionate about and it was much appreciated. Any other questions or prospective applicants for this year, this upcoming year? Okay. So as I said, I am on the scholar side of things, but I'm more than happy to assist you with basic questions. If you are on our website and you click contact at the bottom, this gives you a couple of contacts. As I said, your advisor is going to be your first point of contact, and if you have further questions, our regions are broken down and there are specific contacts by region. So this is a great way to reach out. And I encourage you to actually email rather than call just because you can have a paper trail and it's easier to get correspondence with one person. So please email us. If you have any questions, please follow us on social media. Please reach out to your advisor with any questions. We are here to assist. Okay, if there are no more questions, that would conclude the presentation. Thank you. Um, since we have a little bit of time, if you'd like to talk about